Okay, so we're looking at my last Duchess by Robert Browning. Um, before we go into the structure, there's a couple of things we need to take note of as far as the context is concerned. See at the top it says Ferrara. Does anybody know what that links to? Yep. Uh, is it, uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's a town in 16th century Italy. It's also the name of the Duke, is that um, the Duke would have been given the name of the town that he was the Duke of. So it's the Duke of Ferrara we're talking about. Now, Robert Browning, the guy who wrote this, he had a big thing about 16th century Italy and he wrote loads and loads of poems that were based upon um, artworks that were uh, that were painted at the time taking on the characters within those so that's why this is effectively it's a made-up story based upon a myth about the Duke of Ferrara during um, the 14th and 16th centuries I'm not actually quite sure when Duke of Ferrara was around. And um, it hits it quite nicely with the whole idea of the context of this. That This was written in the 1800s, but it's about a 16th century Duke. So we can make quite a bit out of the fact that he's looking back in time, looking at these stories of days past. And in theory, you could actually comp uh, compare this to something like Bayonet Charge, which is imagined experience, you know, 20, 30 years after the effect. Same with this, although slightly more than 20, 30 years. So if we look down onto the context and the story, the story of the poem, can somebody tell me what the story of the poem is? Wow, we've all gone to sleep today. Uh, De Moon, can you tell me what's going on in the poem? Uh, well, we're not 100% sure whether he's killed his wife. We have the Duke. Yeah. He's showing off a portrait of his former wife. Okay, and I think the key thing here is showing off because it's all about his pride, this poem. It's very firmly about his pride. Because even though, yes, it is suggested or hinted at that he may have had his wife bumped off, and at the very end we get the discussion about his future wife, once he's had a chat about how much money she comes with. Um, the Duchess's death, or her subsequent no longer being the Duchess, isn't really commented on. It's how she affects his pride throughout, the, um, throughout her marriage to him is what's commented on the most. So what can you guys tell me about the structure of this poem? Oscar, you were commenting on this earlier. What can you tell me about the structure? Hmm? The structure. Very long. What's it lacking? Um, yeah, it's all one stanza. It's a dramatic monologue. <coughs> it's almost a bit of a rant, really, or a whine, because the Duke is basically sitting there trying to justify why his, uh, he wasn't pleased with his wife's... Um, uh, behavior and it moves through as they're walking so the the meter of the speech meter of the poem is in iambic pentameter iambic pentameter is meant to um, be similar to the way English people speak Okay, so iambic pentameter. Do we remember what iambic pentameter is? Ellie? Any idea? 
Josephine, any idea? Iambic pentameter. Yeah, it's to do with where this stress falls, and it's basically it's five pairs of syllables. Okay, with the stressed one, stress falling on the second. The second half. Basically, it sounds like a heartbeat, that. Okay, so it's also a heartbeat. Shakespeare writes in, a, in iambic pentameter an awful lot. It was very, very common. And it's supposed to match... It's supposed to match the way that we speak. So, you'll notice there's a lot of enjambment in this poem, which again helps to mimic the idea of speech. And you'll see an awful lot of it actually is to do with his arrogance. All of the notes that you will get from this, they will literally keep on telling you again and again and again how arrogant the Duke is. So, I'm going to come up to the title. My Last Duchess. Three words. First of all, Duchess. Okay, so we know that the Duke is talking. Often in poetry, we don't know who the narrator is. It's very clear that the Duke is the narrator here. What does last imply? More than one. Yeah, there's, there's another one coming. And my. Come on, the easy one here. What does my imply? Anushka. Yes, yeah, possessive. My last duchess. It implies that she belongs to him and that he owns her. It's quite a negative thing. My last duchess. So, let's come over to the poem. We're going to read through the first few lines. I'm going to go down to... The question mark. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will it please you sit and look at her? So, we're starting in a conversation, okay? He's obviously addressing someone. And we get this idea that he is... Yeah, that's my last duchess painted on the wall. He's not talking about her, he's talking about the painting. But he doesn't refer to it as a painting of her. She is the painting. And when you get that looking as if she were alive here, he's talking about her as if she's an object. So he's objectifying her already in the objectifying. Literally, in the first two lines... You know, he's not talking about her, he's talking about the painting. I call that piece a wonder. Now, Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day. Fra Pandolf, simply the name of the artist. Why would he mention the name of the artist? What's he doing? Showing Sorry? Showing, Showing off. Yeah, you don't name drop unless you expect somebody to know who they are. And it's repeated down here, Fra Pandolf by design. So he's name dropping. Look how rich I am. I can afford for this random monk to come and paint my wife. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day and there she stands. Well, please you sit and look at her. Sounds quite polite, but... Does he give him the opportunity to answer? No. 
So he's actually asked a rhetorical question, hasn't he? He's not expecting an answer. It's a rhetorical question. I'm just going to put RQ. You guys all know what that means. So, it's, it's very forceful. It's very, no, I'm in charge. Of course I'm in charge. Worked busily a day, and there she stands. Well, please you to sit, uh, sit and look at her. I said, Fra Pandolf, by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance. No one else has seen this picture. Okay? She, this is the first person to look at her. Strangers like you. No one else has seen it. Sorry, that does say no one else has seen it. Big problem with trying to make it closer on the text. It means I can't show so much. Okay, so coming back. The depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself, they turned... Now, that's interesting. The depth and passion. What does that suggest about the Duchess? Depth and passion of that earnest glance. So earnest means she means it, okay? So the depth and passion, so he, the, the glance is what she's, is, is her look. And basically it means that she's looking with intent, you know, quite um, meaningfully at Fra Pandolf. What does that suggest about her as a person? Is she, does it suggest she's flighty or frivolous? No, it, it's very much that she's, um, she's got passion. You know, she's not a, um, a silly little giggly little girl. She's actually somebody who's quite serious. Which when you consider later on in the poem, that he basically whinges on about the fact that she smiles at everyone, doesn't really fit with that kind of um, description of her. She's trying hard. Now, something to consider here. If the Duke is the one in charge, who has asked Fra Pandolf to paint her picture? It's not a trick question. It's really obvious. It's the Duke. So why would she be trying hard to look good in a picture that her husband is having painted? What does she want to do? to please her husband doesn't she so she's trying hard to please her husband now when we consider how he treats her later on what we can see here is we can see that she he doesn't perceive her as trying hard but what he does but this here shows that actually she looks like she was actually trying to please her husband and do her best Casey um, could we take it in the way that um, like he wanted her painting That is a possibility that he already knew that that was what he was going to do. Especially considering as nobody else has seen the picture. So it implies that perhaps the picture was painted just before um, something happened. But as we have no definite proof that he was actually planning on having her killed, I think it's more to do with the fact that um, his expectation of her is that she will try hard because um, he has commanded it, so therefore she must do it. And she's not that frivolous, sort of bored arist aristocrat that's going, oh yeah, I suppose I'll have to do it. She's actually throwing herself into it, which implies that she actually wants to be a good duchess. She wants to be a good wife. He, on the other hand, doesn't agree with it. Strangers like you, that, um, that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of his earnest glance, but to myself they turned. Since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I. Okay, so he's the only person that draws the curtain. What does that mean about him? What's, it, what's he doing here? Yeah? Because when he let him, um, who wants 
Yeah. Good. He's in control of her image. Even in her death, he is in control of her. Complete control. And seemed as if they would... Um, but to myself they turned and seemed as if they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask us. So he's a, um, he thinks that people might ask why she looks like that. And he doesn't want people to ask about it. So she's got an unusual look on her face. Now, this is quite interesting because he doesn't want to tell the story, but he's just deliberately opened the curtains up for this person. So he's pretending he doesn't want to tell the story, but quite clearly he actually does want to tell the story. Okay? So, not the first of you to turn and ask thus, Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. So this is the crux of the matter. It was not her husband's presence only that called that spot of joy into her cheek. She is happy a lot of the time. You know, she's not just happy when her husband's around. She's happy at other times as well. And that is essentially it. The way he has phrased it is that it wasn't just me that made her happy. But what he's actually saying is that she was happy even when I wasn't there. So you get this idea that he's turning it around and it's all about him. This very self-centred approach. The arrogance here that he expects her to only be happy when he's in the room. That she, sh she should be miserable when he's not there. Perhaps for our Pandolf chance to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Or paint must never hope to rep um, reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. So he thinks the reason she's smiling is because Fra Pandolf um, effectively gave her a compliment. But this second one, paint must never hope to reduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. This is really interesting here. Because we've got the mention of the word death and we know that the Duchess is dead. Okay? 16th century Italy, you didn't get remarried unless your wife was gone and you were a widower. So the, w the wife is dead and we have this, Im this image here of red around her throat. And what does, that, what does that imply to us? Nice and easy? Yeah. Implies blood and death. This whole idea that the Duchess has actually been murdered. Another thing it is, because it's around her throat, gives the idea of somebody being cutthroat, being mercenary, which could suggest maybe an assassin or some form of, you know, the Duke certainly won't have sullied his hands killing her himself. Could also argue that it could suggest that she's been strangled because traditionally the strangling of women is how you got rid of them. Yes, it's a lovely thought, isn't it? But when you look at, histori when you look at historical literature, you will find that nine times out of ten, if a woman's murdered, she's usually strangled. So that's another thing to consider. But it all suggests that the Duke has indeed bumped her off, whether he's done it deliberately um, himself or whether he's done it by hiring somebody remains to be seen. But it certainly implies that she has been killed by him. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. So why does she smile at people? Courtesy. Nathaniel, why does she smile at people? What does courtesy mean? 
Yeah, politeness. She smiles because she thinks she's being polite. She thought and caused enough for calling upon that spot of joy. Keeps on referring to it as a spot of joy. Implies that may, when we think of a spot on somebody's face, what do we often think of that as? Yeah, like a zit, a blemish, isn't it? So, he feels that her joy is a blemish. Unwanted. And on top of that, we've got this idea that she genuinely feels that the reason that she is smiling is she's, she's being polite. It's polite to smile. It's polite to be kind to people. Ah. Oh, God, not the camera now. Okay. So it's polite to smile. It's polite to show people that you care. The Duke, on the other hand, disagrees. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad. He's trying to find the words. He doesn't want to be too mean. You know, he's trying to find the correct vocabulary to talk about her. Too easily impressed. She liked what air she looked on and her looks went everywhere. So, her looks went everywhere everywhere. He thinks she's being flirty because she's looking everywhere. Too easily impressed, too soon made glad. And she, he's basically saying that she likes too much. She's too nice. So it was all one. My favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace. All and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. So he's basically saying that everything in her life makes her smile, including him. So it's not like she doesn't like him. It's not like she doesn't like him. She does like him. She just doesn't appear to like him any more or any less than anything else. It's interesting how he refers to the, the person that gave her cherries as officious, meaning offensive. Is it offensive to give somebody something nice? No, it's a servant being nice to her and she's being nice back. And all that rhyme there really sort of flushes it through, doesn't it? All in each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anyone's gift. So, here's the crux. She thanked men. And he thinks she shouldn't be talking to men in this, uh, um, now that she's his. He is jealous and he thinks she's having an affair because, he's, uh, because she is so um, positive to other men. As if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift and he feels that she should be thankful. She should be grateful for the fact that he, he bothered to marry her. She should be grateful. And who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? What does the word stoop mean? Anyone? Yeah. He feels that she's beneath him. 
so he's married down. She is beneath him. Who'd stop, stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear, such an one. He's claiming he, that he isn't very good at speaking. Is he very good at speaking? Yeah, yeah very much so. It's false modesty. He's trying to convince the, um, the bloke that he's talking to that he's got a reason for feeling the way that he does. <laughs> Stop it, please. Okay. Even had you the skill in speech, which I have not to make your will, quite clear to such an one, and say just this, or that in you disgust me, here you miss, or there you exceed the mark, and if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth and made excuse. So he's saying, even if he could have, cho he could have chosen to tell her what the problem was, but he chose not to. He never told her. But she annoyed him. She never, he never told her that she annoyed him. I mean, all that in you disgusts me. Look at the language he uses, or exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened. So he's of the opinion that there was no point in telling her because she wouldn't change anyway. In then would some be stooping, and I choose never to stoop. So he's saying that he felt it was beneath him to tell her what the problem was. Sorry, gone too low. She should just know. Sir, she smiled, no doubt, when I air passed, whene'er I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? There's only one thing here that hints that maybe she might have gone further than just smiling, and that's this grew. So that could imply that has she had an affair? We don't know, but that's the one line that suggests that there may have been more, because it grew, it got worse. Could mean that he just saw it as being worse, but it could also mean that actually she did get worse. We don't know. And he gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. The implication is there that, she, that he's had her killed, that he's had her murdered, but we don't know. It is ambiguous. And all smiles stop together. The end. And then we get this re repetition. There she stands, as if alive. Back to the beginning. Will you please rise? Again, this bloke, the person he's talking to has got no autonomy, has to do as he's asked. We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. So he's got no, he's, he's trying to organise another, uh, another wife for himself. Organising Duchess to Yes. Though his fair daughter self, as I avowed, as st at starting is my object. So he's being pretty obvious here, my object. He's already objectifying the next Duchess. She is property. 
And same with his comment about the dowry, about paying for her. More suggestion that it's property. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though. So, we're going downstairs for a chat now, but while we're here, notice Neptune, though. Taming a seahorse. A king taming an animal. Why has he pointed out what uh, why has he pointed out Neptune? What's he doing there? Taming a seahorse. Yeah, he's basically saying I'm going to tame. Yeah, be, um the new duchess better beware, she's going to be tamed. I'll tame Duchess too, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Again, personal pronoun. That suggests that um, he, basically he owns everything. So there's a real feel of arrogance and pride in this, um, in this poem. He is really jealous of the simple fact that the Duchess simply likes a lot of things. As far as he's concerned, there is only one job she has, and that is to make him happy. But he's not going to tell her how to make him happy. She should know that already. Okay, thanks guys.